demonstrate it would explain this yeah. high degree of utilization. Yeah, you thanks. Know, it traditionally doesn't have water, it doesn't have the pressure. Or the <laughs> yeah, it'll be, especially I think with the remote sensing yeah. stuff, um, it'll be interesting to see how those patches were with proximity to those water points to see, um, because obviously they wouldn't have been. Yeah, yeah. thanks very much. Awesome. Thanks very much, Jess. Thank you. Thank you. Right, the next talk is by Tarek, he's still carrying on, on elephants. Um, I'm glad he's putting a little pretty picture of a little, little elephant. Right, thanks Tarek. Yeah, I don't know where's the, where's the red pointer at the moment. Silver button. Oh, the silver button. Okay. There you go. Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, morning everyone. Um, okay, we heard a bit uh, from Sue von Rendsburg yesterday about open systems in East Africa and some of the problems um, associated with that and things they're picking up now. And we just heard a little bit about uh, a closed system in Malawi. Um, I'm going to continue that and highlight some of the issues that we face with small or medium-sized fence reserves um, in this country. Okay, um, the effective management of our protected areas often requires that we understand both the, the, the how and the why of animals moving through landscapes, how they move through a landscape and why they do it in a certain way. Um, and what are the drivers of this movement or selection or utilization of the landscape? Um, satellite GPS collars have provided an easy and effective way, if expensive, um, to answer these questions and obtain this data. Um, there are also currently excellent GIS-based techniques and software that allow us to analyze this data and, and question the integrity of this data. Um, and elephants are the perfect case study for this because of their size, their longevity, and the way they move through the landscape. Uh, as well as the fact that they can hold massive GPS collars which last for ages. <laughs> Convenient. Okay, and I mean, everyone knows there's currently a concern about increasing elephant numbers uh, in small fence PAs. Um, this is, I mean, just some of the concerns are an increase in the frequency of returns to specific habitat types, uh, prolonged habitat use, and therefore the destruction of sensitive or rare habitat. I mean, these are just focusing on habitat concerns, obviously. So we examined the drivers of seasonal cow herd habitat preference and daily movements in Shishli Amphalosi Park. It was part of my master's thesis uh, over two years um, and collected quite a bit of data, thousands, tens of thousands of GPS points. And we <coughs> tried to relate the answers or the, the, the results of the analysis <coughs> to, directly to conservation management. Okay, so just a bit of methodology. Uh, we GPS colored the matriarchs of five cow herds. Um, and yeah, data collected over two years. We, uh, essentially, a matriarch dictates the movement of the entire herd, so for the purposes of the study, calling a matriarch meant that you'd get data on the movements of the matriarch's herd. Um, and we used a spatially explicit approach, what's called the utilization distribution. It's an approach that's been used a lot in North America by guys working on elk, um, caribou, and it's, it's quite a different approach to the standard sort of uh, preference ratios and, and, and typical home range kernels. Um, and it was based on 30 minute location fixes, which is quite important, I'll get into that later, but basically a point from the GPS collar every half hour leads to lots of points. And yeah, so we constructed some kernel home ranges and we overlaid these onto various GIS layers, surface water, vegetation type, um, and yeah, we did a, a few simple analyses, just intersect functions, I'll get into that later as well. And I mean, one of the things, obviously the main thing we wanted to look at was seasonal habitat preference. So we ran a composition and analysis of the utilization distributions, which I'll show you now. And we questioned vegetation productivity and looked at seasonal variance in that using satellite-derived NDVI data. Okay, so, I mean, there's a veg map, a veg layer based on Wakeley and Porter's work from, from 1975, uh, just sort of merged habitat types. But if you look over there, oh, sorry, um, thank you. If you look over there, you can see some of the blue scrub forest patches in the <coughs> north, and there's the, the white and black Amphalosi rivers, and the Shishlui River over there. And these little red points represent a <coughs> subsample of, of some of the elephant locations. And from this, we get this. Now, <laughs> some of you are wondering, this is not a topography layer. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
these hills don't exist in Amphilozi. Um, what this is, is the utilization distribution. So basically, this is your typical kernel home range. I mean, you're used to seeing it in this form. But what we've done is we've just flipped this up into 3D. So you can actually see these hills represent <coughs> intensities of use are greater. The green is higher intensity use areas in the landscape based on concentrations of points. So if you remember the last slide I showed you with a lot of points in the north, there, that's high concentration use, and you're getting these high peaks, which what we call Z values. So the X and Y values are coordinates, your spatial coordinates, and your Z values, your intensity of use, just so nobody gets confused. <coughs> so that's an example of one herd. Here's another herd, totally different. Here, they're using the whole park in the dry <coughs> season, and compared to the last herd, which was just up here in the north of Shishlui. So you're getting variance between herds. You can see that already from your, from your home ranges. Okay, and then we question daily movement as well, because we wanted to look at two different scales. One, the home range scale, um, and seasonal movement, and one, at a sort of daily movement. I mean, I've just zoomed in here to show you a sub <coughs> of different movement parts. These are, these are basically half an hour points. And we question two measures of movement, step length and part tortuosity. Now, step length is the distance from one point to the next for the purposes of this. So it's a distance an elephant moves between half hourly points. And part tortuosity is the complexity of each movement part. So if a part's doing this, that's a pretty complex part. part. And if it's doing that, if it's straighter, it's less complex. Um, and we looked at the variation between, uh, we looked at the variation in this movement between seasons and between habitats. And separate to that, we built a general linearized model and used AIC model selection to question uh, some of the determinants of the step length. We looked at time of day, so we split some of these movement parts up into morning, after, uh, morning, midday, and evening, and we looked at distance to water, proportion of habitat present along a movement path, and season. So these were some of the things that we, that we questioned. Okay, um, just getting into some results. Basically, don't, what you need to take out from this is the fact that the, the results of the composition analysis rank habitat use in a system from zero to one, zero being least used or least preferred, and four being most preferred. Um, in all cases, in wet season one, or, or wet season of the first year, wet season of, season of the second year, dry season of the first year, and dry season of the second year, forest was preferred in, in the dry season significantly, significantly so, indicated by the three pluses over all other habitats. Okay, the step length within habitat use, if you... Okay, just again, highlighting two things. Firstly, the fact that there are large differences between dry and wet seasons. So, the, the, the dry seasons in grey, large differences for most <coughs> habitat types, and scalp forest, which is SCP habitat, in the north of Shishlui, significantly less movement. So, if, if remembering that step length is your function or, or your measure of movement, much less movement in scalp forest habitat than others. And this is just an example of, herd, of two different herds again. This herd didn't move into scalp forest at all, but yet there's substantial variation in wet and dry season movement. So just highlighting that as well. Okay, and then our multivariate model, some of the, the results of, of, of that, just t morning, midday, evening, so movement parts. Just to highlight the morning, look at that there. Um, the fact that in the dry season, significantly lower, and the fact that morning and evening are much lower than midday. And this is, quite, this is quite strange. I mean, we have a typical idea of understanding that elephants move less at midday. It's hot, um, they're, they're hiding in the shade, but this is showing something totally different. I mean, we'll get into that data as well. Uh, tortuosity, so the path complexity. Differences here as well. Scalp forest again, a bit higher. Riparian forest, next highest. So we're getting a bit of pattern forming. Okay, and then the seasonal vegetation productivity. I mean, I don't want to go into the details of how we use the satellite-derived NDVI data, but suffice to say that scalp forest was a lot greener than most other habitats, except for thicket, um, in both wet and dry seasons. So, and there was also <coughs> significant variation between season. Okay, uh, the results of the multivariate model. So, our global model, which is your model with, with all of your factors in it, so, so time of day, distance to water, uh, season, etc., that model ranked the highest. So that model explained 99% of the variance that we were seeing in our response variable, which was step length. And from that, we took away our main, sorry, our main determinants of movement, 
which were time of day and proportion of habitat type along a movement path. Um, interestingly, non-significant variables were distance to water. I mean, who's to say that elephants always move in response to water distribution? Uh, season had no effect and herd, herd or sip, herd ID had no effect as well. Okay, so just a quick summary of all of that. Um, <coughs> forest habitat was selected for preferentially in both seasons. <coughs> um, restricted movement and higher path tortuosity was witnessed in scarp forest. Uh, less movement in the dry season, possibly a response to resource scarcity, it makes sense. Um, and less movement in mornings and evenings compared to midday. Now, a lot of studies suggest that, that uh, less movement in mornings and evenings for large herbivores is equivalent to or equals um, foraging and in this case crepuscular foraging. We know from elephants that they do a lot of their foraging early at morning, so dawn and dusk, so this makes sense as well, but not proven. We're not sure. And more mobile at midday, contrary to most other studies, the honest answer is I don't know why. I, I, I mean, there was no relation to distance to water, so it wasn't because they were moving to drink water. We don't know why. That's something to look at. Um, in another study, but quite interesting. Uh, proportions of certain habitats along <coughs> movement paths influenced movement that came out quite strongly as well. And the fact that scarp forest habitat was the greenest. Okay, so what does this mean now to trying to tie this into conservation? Okay, scarp forest, according to Messina and Rutherford's Vegetation in South Africa book and various other sources, has exceptionally high endemism and species richness and is one of the most important forest types across South Africa. It's well recognized as that. It's very fragmented and isolated, or it exists as very fragmented and isolated patches in Chishnei and Pelosi, but yet very few people talk about it. He talks always about riparian forest and riparian use. Um, increasing elef elephant populations may potentially threaten habitat in integrity. And I underline potentially because the honest answer is we don't know. Selection does not equal utilization. So, Although I put up lovely maps of occupancy, and we can see that they're certainly occupying scalp forest, they're moving slower, they're spending time in it, that does not mean utilization. We don't know what they're doing in it. And, I mean, part of our mandate is to conserve biodiversity. So, I mean, this includes habitats, doesn't it? So, should we think about that? Maybe. Okay, and then solutions. I mean, this is going back to the great debate, but I mean, we could call certain herds based on sound utilization data, but we don't have that data. Impacts on scalp forest vegetation are unknown. So we lack data, something that Bruce brought up in his talk. We lack data for a lot of, in a lot of these instances. We don't know what's happening in scalp forests. Creation of botanical reserves, elephant explosions. This is happening at Tembi. It could work, yes. Could it work there? Maybe, maybe not. Contraception, it's a long-term solution, but will not solve concerns of habitat use. Just delay them. And land expansion, I mean, we all know about that and the issues surrounding that. Some reserves have greater potential than others for that. So there's options out there, but we need to ask the right questions. And I mean, in conclusion, <coughs> from my study, we showed that elephant movements can be used to evalu evaluate occupancy of, and therefore infer threats to specific habitats. But we need to ask the right questions. And those are, what are the core conservation goals, objectives of each protected area? Are elephants currently compromising <coughs> those goals? And is there sufficient and sound proof of that? And that is what's missing at the moment, which is what Bruce really highlighted. And so if we ask those questions, and will implementing any of those solutions or a new solution actually solve the problem? If we ask those questions, perhaps we can move forward. But at this point in time, we are certainly in an area where we don't know that much. Thank you. All right, it takes quite up a fair bit of time. Questions, Adrian? Derek, when I work in the Scott Forest there,